Now, and I want to talk about the fundamental of responsibility, and I want to introduce this topic by telling you a story from my Air Force flying career. Uh, I have to preface the story with this point. I was not an Air Force fighter pilot for this reason right here. My eyes were bad. I had to wear glasses. So I flew in the back seat of fighters, the F-4 Phantom mostly. If you saw the movie Top Gun, remember Tom Cruise was Maverick, his backseater's call sign was Goose. That's what I was. I was an Air Force Goose flying in the back of these F-4s. Now, I wasn't married to Meg Ryan like the goose in the movie was, which, by the way, is her great loss, or so I would like to believe. <laughs> OK, the story I want to relate to you right now involves my very first flight in this airplane, the F-111. This has side-by-side -side seating. The goose rides the right side of the pilot. I was making my first flight in this airplane doing some weapons, test, weapons testing over the Gulf of Mexico. In the course of that weapons test, we reached a point called bingo fuel. Bingo fuel is a safety point. You calculate it before you ever take off. It's the fuel state at which you're supposed to stop the mission and fly home because theoretically, at bingo fuel, you only have enough gas to do that. Safely cruise back to your base, attempt to land, not be able to land because the weather's bad, the field's closed for some reason, and have to divert to another base maybe 100 miles away or so. So bingo fuel was a safety point. I knew that. I had 1,500 hours of goose time from the back of the F-4 that told me that. Now here I am on my first flight in this airplane staring at bingo fuel. I pointed out the pilot on my left expecting him to fly home, but we had one more data point to get in this weapons test. And he said, looked at me and said, we can get this last data point. OK. So we sailed past that safety point. I'll cut to the chase. The airplane that took off looking like this, and which cost us taxpayers tens of millions of dollars, ended the mission as this pile of wreckage on the Eglin Field runway. And I wish I could tell you there were some heroics involved here, but there weren't. We ran out of gas. And as the plane was crashing, I reached for the ejection handle and pulled it. On the F-111, that separates the entire cockpit. The crew remains inside. A parachute is, is catapulted out, and the cockpit is lowered to the ground. In our case, the ground was the runway. So we were close, but co close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. It doesn't count landing one of these jets. Now, what does this story have to do with responsibility? Well, I'll bet everybody here can see where I'm going with this story. I want everybody to come back into the cockpit with me at that moment in the flight where we reached bingo fuel. I pointed out that pilot on my left expecting him to fly home, but instead he looked at me and said, we can get this last data point. And even though at that critical moment there was this little voice whispering in the back of my brain, oh, Malane, this doesn't look right. We don't have a lot of gas. We're sucking it down in a big hurry. We're 70 miles out over the water, long way from home. The weather's bad back home. This doesn't look right. Say something. Put your perspective on the situation out there on the table for this guy to consider. But I didn't say a word. Basically, at this critical moment in this team operation, I ceased to be a team member and became what? A passenger. And why did I do it? Well, let me tell you. For the identical reason in your past lives, you've done the same thing. This is the original sin of teamwork. We're all guilty of it. You may not have done it in a long time, and hopefully you'll never do it again. But I guarantee each and every one of you can remember back in moments in your careers where you were seeing something. You were sitting in a meeting and hearing something. Maybe you had an idea. You had a concern. But just as I did in that F-111, you sat there mute. You didn't say a word. You became a passenger. And then years later, or maybe weeks, months, even years later, you regret it. Because now you can see that something bad happened out here that might not have happened had you maintained your team presence and put your idea or concern out on the table for the team and the leadership to consider those many weeks, months, and even years earlier. Why do we do this? And I'll tell you, it can happen in a heartbeat. We're going from effective team member, next moment we're sitting there as passengers. There's lots of reasons, but here are some of the real, real uh, whoops, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Uh, one of the major reasons is we end up in that mode of, of wanting to accept this group think. We'll sit there. And, and go along with the flow with a group, whereas individually we would never, never agree to accept it. You know, we'd have, if somebody came to us individually and asked our opinion, we would have that opinion. We'd put it out there. But in a group, it's, we don't want to deal with confrontation. It's easy to go with the flow, you know, that group think. That'll turn us into a passenger. We assume others are going to take action. We don't need to. Uh, we defer to people who have been in the organization longer and occupy loftier positions, rationalizing they have to to know better than we. You know, that's what turned me into an, in, in that F-111, that's what turned me into a passenger. 
I was the goose. I had 30 minutes of flying time in this plane. The pilot to my left had 1,000 hours in it, and he was the aircraft commander. So I rationalized at that bingo fuel point that, hey, he's got to know what he's doing. He's got so much time in the plane. He is the aircraft commander. Surely he sees the situation more clearly than I. And so I deferred to him, position and longevity. And disaster resulted. My near death, his near death, and the loss of that plane. These are just some of the reasons that we can slip into this passenger mode. And uh, I tell you, when it happens, the team is jeopardized. If everybody is not on board with the team, if we have any passengers on the team, the team is jeopardized. This right here is the irreducible essence of our responsibility as individuals on a team, right here, is making sure we count. We never slip into that passenger mode. The power of all teams, folks, resides in the individual. We, and I say that, it's the engine, the individual is the power of the team. Uh, and the reason I can say that is none of us are clones. We've had this diversity of life experience. And through this diversity of life experience, we bring a diversity of perspectives to team situations. You may have 99 people on a team, and because of their common life experience, they have a common perspective. And then you have one other individual who worked somewhere else, was on a different team, had a different boss, had something happen to them in their past lives that is now giving them a different perspective on the situation. And if they would maintain their team presence, put it out there for the team and the leadership to consider, it could have a measurable and significant impact on the safety and success of the team. But it only works when 100 out of 100 people are doing it, not 99 out of 100, maintaining that team presence. And I would encourage everybody, when you talk about, about uh, individual responsibility, to tattoo this quote on your brain. This is a quote by former US President Andrew Jackson. One person with courage forms a majority. And that's very true. Another way people dismiss themselves into the passenger mode is assuming they don't count. The team's too big. You know, nobody's going to hear them. And they dismiss themselves into that passenger mode. Everybody counts, folks, because none of us are clones. And we all bring this diversity of life experience to the team that gives us this diversity of perspectives. So let's remember that. You count. I don't care if you've been on the job day one or if you're getting ready to retire after 30, 30 years. You count because you are not replicated anywhere else on that team. And I would encourage leaders to make sure they lead with this philosophy, empowerment, to make sure in word and deed you're telling your teams, hey, I value you as an individual. I recognize your uniqueness, that, it's not, that you're not duplicated. If I'm going to lead this team and be in the safest and the most successful it can be, I have to climb into your brains and take a look around. I want to hear from you. That is a critical aspect of leadership, and that's empowerment, making sure nobody is allowed to slip into that passenger mode, that everybody counts. 